church is more than a building or a worship service. It's a people. We are the family of God on the mission of God. We gather on weekends to worship God and then scatter to make a difference. We gather in groups to connect with God, each other, and to meet community needs. We're transformed as we love and obey Jesus. We equip each person to be empowered by the Spirit and to love like Jesus loves. We will glorify God by multiplying disciples, groups, and churches everywhere. Crossroads Church, changing the world by making disciples to make disciples. Like, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Crossroads. Would you please stand together? worship our king come let us bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see what his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great things You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great through every storm you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and I know you will do it again for your promises yes and amen you will do great things God you do great things You conquered the grave You freed every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great things it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. A hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great
on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room. You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. saturate us. Amen and amen and amen. Um, we're just going to sing that one more time just, just as we cry out to God. Say, Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Sing this together. 
Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Amen and amen. We're just going to take a moment right now as God's children just to say hello to those worshiping around us. Tell someone your name. They'd love to know it. Good morning, Crossroads family. How are we doing this morning? Yeah, there we go. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, welcome to Crossroads. If this is your first time, we won't embarrass you. You don't have to stick your hand up or anything. But if you could do two things, that'd be awesome. If you could take out your phone and text the number on the screen, 97,000. Text the word XR West. It's just a great way to let us know that you're here. Also, we have a free gift for you. So if you head out these doors to that little white half table there, we'd love to get that gift in your hands. Also, if you have your phone out and haven't done it yet, download the Crossroads app. You can go to the Google Play Store, the App Store, and Search Crossroads Pittsburgh. That's a great way to stay up to date with all that we're doing as a church. But also, and more importantly, we have a communicator card on there. The communicator card does two things. It, it, one, if you need prayer requests, if like life is just getting you down or you just need someone to pray for you for a situation, please fill out that card. People from our team will be praying for you often. As well as if you just want to serve, there's other areas you want to get involved in. That's a great way to let us know that you want to be involved. Also, if you are new-ish to Crossroads, or if you, like my three-year-old toddler, love free donuts, please meet me after service right out these doors for Next Step. So Next Step is just an opportunity for you to get to know a little bit more about what we do at Crossroads, and also for us just to get to know you a little bit more. So we talk about some of the exciting opportunities we have coming up. So if you'd love to meet me, or if you just want to talk a little bit more about what we do at Crossroads and you're new-ish here and want a free donut, meet me after service just outside these two doors. Coming up here at Saturday, April 13th, is our BLESS training. Now, if you've never heard that word BLESS, uh, what that means is a BLESS training uh, kind of helps equip you and teach you how to share Jesus with others. So maybe if you think, how do I share my faith with you know, people in my relational circle? BLESS is a great way to do that. It gives you to, like, actual practical strategies uh, and tactics to just kind of become familiar and comfortable with sharing your story and kind of following some of the ways of Jesus. So if you're interested in just you know, taking that next step and learning how do I I share my faith? How do I see the people in my relational circles come to know Jesus? The BLESS training is a great way to do that. So the one-day training, uh, Saturday, April 13th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and you can register at xr.church slash bless. Coming up on April 19th to the 20th, I'm particularly excited about this. Focus 2024 is here. Uh, if you have a student in the room, I have a teenager, we would love to see them attend Focus. Focus is a very unique event that we do every year here at Crossroads because it's about bringing new kids in to experience Jesus, but also to go out to our communities to serve those who need it. And so uh, coming this year, we have an awesome speaker named Angela Madden, who's from the Pittsburgh area. We have an incredible comedian named Shama Marema. And then if you know uh, Chris Sherwood and his band, The Threshing Floor, are coming as well. Uh, so it's going to be an awesome uh, overnight event for teens just to really find, uh, to hear more about who Jesus is and also serve our community. So if you have a teen, please register. The early bird pricing ends today. So go online to xr.church slash focus. Maybe you don't have a teen in the room, but you just want to be a part of what we're doing. Head to the same website, xr.church slash focus, and there's an opportunity for you to serve. We need some servants in our meal team and also some of our groups. So we'd love to connect with you if you want to serve our students. So sign up for Focus April 19th to the 20th. Uh, lastly, I just want to talk about just a moment of, of our offering. And so what we do as followers of believers, part of our worship is our offering to God, right? And so part of that obedience and sacrifice I think is so important because it takes kind of the pressure off of us, where sometimes we feel like uh, my life is in my hands. But I think what's cool about giving to Jesus is it kind of relinquishes that. It says, even though life is stressful or hard, I'm going to give something of my own that we value as important and put it in God's hands. And every single time, at least in my experience, God has moved and showed up. So if you want to give, there's a couple ways you can give. You can give one through our app. You can give from on our website, xr.church slash give, or you can give in the drop box, little blue box in the back. So if you join me in prayer, just a moment by your heads as we pray for the offering. Jesus, we just thank you so much for who you are. 
Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. That ever that we are here on a beautiful Pittsburgh morning, Father, that you are just alive here with us in our service. God, we just ask that you bless the offering today, that you multiply it, Father, that you will use uh, our resources better than we could, God, that you help us reach all the people here in Pittsburgh, but also all over Pennsylvania and all over the U.S., all over the world, God, that you are, are seeing just this awesome new movement of revival and renewal as we live today. So God, we just ask that you use it. Also, God, we just pray for those in the room today who, Lord, I just, I've been getting the sense um, all morning of just this, like, people are tired. Like, you, maybe, maybe you're tired, maybe uh, you just feel kind of burnt out or maybe a little, a little bit of hopeless. And I got this, this picture in my mind early this morning of, uh, it sounds funny, but like uh, a linebacker in football kind of like breaking through the line so that the running back can run through. And I feel like the Lord in some way is saying, hey, listen, if you feel tired, if you feel burnt out, if you feel hurting, God is, is going before you and he's going to open a path. And so maybe you don't feel that way. Maybe life just feels heavy and hard. Today, I just want, want to give you a piece of hope that God sees you, he hears you, he knows your situation, and God is going before you, blazing a path for you. You just have to look to him that nothing else can shake uh, shake you if, as long as you keep your eyes on Jesus. So God, let us make that our prayer today that those of us who are just feel like we're struggling, we're hurting, that God, you are before us. And as long as we look at you and our gaze meets yours, that Father, you are with us and nothing else can be against us. So God, we love you. We thank you for all that you're doing in our hearts and here at Crossroads. In your name we pray. Amen. If you're able, won't you join me as we continue in worship? you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. I will love you, Lord. 
this day. I will love you. I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever all my days, I will love you, God. Forever all my days, hallelujah. Sing that together. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Oh, hallelujah, our God you reign. Forever all Just what to do. Our Father, our Redeemer, our Lord, we praise you this morning. We lift up all of our prayers to you, God. We lift up for the message that Pastor Jonathan is going to is going to give us. God, open up our ears to receive the words that you have written in his heart. I praise you, God. We praise you, God. Amen and amen. Please be seated. So sometimes the problem that we think we have isn't really the problem that we actually have. Uh, in 1950s France, there was this doctor named Alfred Tomati, and he was an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat specialist. And he started to have a lot of clients that were opera singers, because his dad was an opera singer, so he would send these clients over to Alfred, and they started to have the same problem. And so uh, it was that they couldn't hit notes that were normally within their singing range. And so they sought out Alfred's help, and they asked him, hey, can you look at our vocal cords, tell us what's going on uh, with our singing so that we can hit these notes again? And so after examining their vocal cords for some time, Alfred started to realize, I don't think that this is the problem that they think. And so he devised this experiment uh, to try and diagnose what was really going on, and so he used an, an a device called a sonometer, which is something that measure, measures decibels that are created by something, so how loud something is. And so he put the sonometer a, a meter away from these opera singers and would have them sing. And he ended up finding out that they would create up to 140 decibels of, of volume just a meter away from them. Uh, and so 
just to give you an idea of how loud that is, a jet engine is about the same amount. Uh, and here's the other thing is, when we speak extern externally, we also hear ourselves internally. So it was even louder inside of their heads. And so what Alfred discovered is that these singers were singing themselves deaf. There was certain uh, strains that they were putting on their, in their inner ear muscles so they could no longer hear the pitches that they were trying to sing. And if you can't hear a pitch, then you can't sing a pitch. And so I think that this diagnosis of Alfred's is a bit like a spiritual parable for us today whenever it comes to hearing from God. Because many of us assume that this is a speaking problem on God's part rather than a hearing problem on ours. Like, we might just assume, you know what, if God wanted to speak, he could, but for some reason, he just doesn't. Maybe he's remote. We think of him as far off. He's uninterested in what's going on in our life. Uh, he's got more important things to do than to concern himself, uh, concern himself with us. Uh, or maybe we just assume that hearing from God is just something that super spiritual people get to do, not for someone like me. Uh, and so then even in Christianity, I think a lot of times within the church, we can be living off of the spiritual lives of others. Like we, we seek out certain certain gifted preachers and teachers so that we can be fed rather than hearing from God on our own. We just get frustrated with that, so we live off of someone else's spiritual life. But uh, this is why I'm glad that you are here today as we start this new series, Cutting Through the Noise. Uh, I'm Jonathan Cordell. I'm the executive pastor of ministry here, and today we're going to look at Luke 10. So if you have a Bible or a, a Bible app, open it with me. We're going to be in Luke 10 starting in verse 38. And here's what I think is important for us to know uh, as we start this series, is that if you follow Jesus, you can expect to hear his voice. Uh, in John 10, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. There's an assumption there that if you follow Jesus, if you're one of his sheep, you can hear the voice of the good shepherd. This is really good for us to know that God wants to be involved in our life, that we can listen to him, that he cares about us, and that he has made us so that we can partner with him as we walk through life. But we're going to find that God's voice isn't just this audible, disembodied voice that's speaking to us from a cloud, much to our chagrin, but that we actually have to learn how to listen to God's voice. And I've got a background in music education, and there's this, tr uh, uh, I've got a background in music, and there's a music education term called ear training. So whenever you're ear training, so if you can hear the feedback, you're ear training right now. <laughs> uh, so ear training is something where you're learning how to listen to the pitch and tell, uh, to a pitch and tell whether it's in tune or not. If a pitch is in tune, uh, it, it's just a subtle, small difference sometimes from whenever it's out of tune. And so when you're in ear training, you're trying to listen and be able to tell what's what. Uh, now, for some people, they just are naturally gifted and having a good ear, you can hear when something is in tune. But for many of us, it takes a lot of work. At first, it takes a lot of concentration to have your ear trained in this way, but eventually it just becomes second nature. And I think the same is true uh, in life with Jesus. Many pe there are some people who just seem naturally gifted at being able to hear from God. For most of us, we have to learn uh, what that's all about, learn how to listen to Him in our everyday life. Uh, so next week, that's what Pastor Christie's going to help us do, learn, uh, help us to learn how we can recognize God's voice. But for today, we're going to focus on our problem with hearing from God, which is that noise is normal. We live in the midst of a really loud world every day that we are inundated with voices, demands, priorities that distract us from hearing the frequency of God's voice. And so that's why this is really important for us to turn to the scriptures. And so today we're going to learn from a couple of Jesus followers. Uh, again, I said, Luke 10, starting in verse 38. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister, Mary, sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. 
But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, a couple of interesting things that we should pay attention to in this story. First is that this is Martha's whole idea to begin with. She's the one that extends the invitation to Jesus over to her house. And she assumes that she needs to be doing all of these things for Jesus rather than be with him. Why is that? Well, I don't think it's entirely her fault. During this time, it's really common for women to kind of be in the background working on entertaining while the men are doing their thing. And so this is what she wants to do. She wants to have, uh, she's got this important rabbi that's over. And for most women during this time, the, uh, uh, what they can really hope for is that whoever their guest is is going to give them kudos for a job well done entertaining. That's like about the best that they can hope for. But when she comes to Jesus saying, hey, isn't this a problem that Mary's not helping me? He flips the script on her. And he says, actually, Mary's on to something here. Uh, like her simple desire just to be with Jesus where he is, this is more important to him than Martha rolling out the red carpet treatment. And I think this is a really good thing for us to notice is that one of Jesus' love languages is quality time. He likes it when we are with him. Now, there's something also scandalous about this, that Jesus is allowing a woman to sit at his feet while he is giving instruction. This is really just not the practice of the majority of rabbis during Jesus' time. And in fact, he's lifting up Mary as this star student. He's saying, we should follow what, what her example is, and here's what we learn from Mary, is that we have to stay near to Jesus in order to hear him. We have to stay near Jesus to hear him. It kind of sounds like a bit of an obvious uh, statement at first, but I think Martha's in, a mistake is really instructive for most of us. I mean, how many times do you just have your own agenda, your own plans, and you simply want Jesus to be an accessory for accomplishing that? Like, if Jesus could just get on the same page as me, things would be good. Uh, but here's the problem with us, with Martha, is that many of our goals, many of our aspirations, they are far less than what God's best for us is. And I think with Martha, she can come off looking a little bad <laughs> when you read this passage at first. Like, she kind of just seems like, oh man, like she's got this epic fail here. But I think actually what Jesus is doing with Martha is empowering and it's redemptive because he's saying, I don't want to just use you as a means of my entertainment. In fact, Martha, you are someone who is worthy of investment. And so I think for many of us today, we need to recognize that D Jesus doesn't want anything from us, but that he simply wants to be with us. And so then the question becomes, am I in proximity to Jesus? Every day we make that choice. Am I going to be close to Jesus or not? And so Mary, she's the one that makes the correct choice. Now here's the thing. In Martha's defense, she does what many of us do. She is at work serving Jesus. She's helping out. And this might be a lot of us today. Like we are just, we love being active. We love helping other people. That's what we naturally gravitate towards. And after all, like if you invite someone over to your house, you want them to have a good experience, right? If you invite someone over, you're not going to just put out like hot pockets and ramen noodles on the table, unless your guests are toddlers and college students. You know, you want them to have a good time. And so here's what's we need to note that Jesus is not pitting serving against listening. It's just the problem comes whenever we serve at the expense of listening to Jesus, when our activity distracts from our attentiveness. We want to be attentive to Jesus with us. 
And so as followers of Jesus, the reason that we serve is because that's the example that Jesus gives us, right? Serving shows the, the character, the nature of God. And so Jesus, you'll notice when you read the Gospels, he's got a full schedule. He's got a full plate all the time. He's doing, doing, doing. But he always has this attentiveness, this presence with God. But the, some of the mistake comes whenever we do things for Jesus rather than with Jesus. And this is the model that he shows us and how he interacts with God the Father. John 5 is this great story where Jesus heals a lame man at, at a pool one day. The problem is that this is on the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath, there's all these strict rules of how you observe that. Jesus is breaking those rules. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they let him know about it. They, they take him to task. And so this is what Jesus says to them. This is the rationale that he gives. He says, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. This is Jesus' sole focus in his earthly life, is being near God the Father, paying attention to what God the Father is up to. We think of Jesus, as, man, he's got, a, he's got an edge on us because, you know, he's the Son of God. He's got divinity kind of going on for him. But Philippians 2 show, tells us that he lays down his right to be God whenever he comes on earth. And so he is just paying attention to God the Father. And so then when he's at work, he's simply doing what he sees God doing. This is why Jesus is able to use the Sabbath as this way of being present with God. So he's just saying, God, what are you up to? That's what I want to be at work doing. The Pharisees, they have settled for much less than God's best, right? The Sabbath for them is about themselves, their own performance, their own agenda, their own accomplishments, whatever they can earn on their own. So the Sabbath and how the Pharisees observe it, it leads to pride for them. With Jesus, when he observes the Sabbath, it is this way of experiencing healing in God's presence. So I think this brings up a good question for us, which is how much would you do differently if you simply did it with God? Like in the United States, it's, it's basically our religion to always be busy, to always act, have activity in our life. Because like the Pharisees, we are really about our own accomplishments. We're really about doing things on our own, filling up ev every part of our schedule that we can. I love what uh, Dallas Willard says, that grace isn't opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. But we have very much an earning mentality in the United States. And we don't even consciously choose to live this way. It's just kind of in the air that we breathe. And so we're just doing what everybody else is doing. And I know I can just speak for myself here. Like there are times where I run the risk of getting overwhelmed with the tsunami of information and demands that are coming at me every single day. Like I, I'm in a time of my life, a season where thinking my own thoughts isn't really a thing because I have a one-year-old and a two-year-old. So like quiet isn't something that I always get around me. Uh, so then whenever I take my work and family responsibilities and then I put in like what we call adulting, like taxes and laundry and uh, doing groceries, I can have all this activity in my life that's drowning out the frequency of God's voice. And I, I just know that I am not the only one in this room today who's, who's struggling with that. And so this is why uh, Mary and Martha's example is good for us to pay attention to. And so today we're going to, uh, as we explore how we can hear from God, let's just spend some time diagnosing our hearing problems so that God can remedy them. And so the scripture highlights this truth that spiritual hearing problems can be both internal and external. So an internal hearing problem is really something that's sourced from me. Uh, so it's really within my control to change. That doesn't mean it's an easy thing to change. It's just, it's within my power to do so. External hearing problems are just uh, things that we have to live with. We didn't choose them, but we do have to choose how we respond to them. And so I'm going to just list some of these, see what might uh, resonate with you, but also maybe there's something else that's not on this list that you're recognizing. This is preventing me from hearing 
hearing God's voice right now. Uh, first internal hearing problem, as I've mentioned, is our agenda. Like, we get tunnel vision. We get locked in on something. This is what happens with Martha, right? Verse 40, it says, Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. Jesus tells her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. Like, how much is that you right here? Are you like Martha, where you focus on the details and distractions over discipleship, over being near God? And so, you know, when you get locked in on something that's in your agenda, sometimes it can be like this compulsion where you are just not satisfied until you have whatever it is that you're looking for. So this can be something in your career at work. Uh, it can be like dreaming up the perfect house, like what you want your house to be like. It can be finding uh, the right significant other. And so it, you like it's like your golem in the Lord of the Rings where whatever is in your agenda, it becomes your precious, and then you will stop at nothing until you get whatever that is. And I'm so glad I don't have this problem. I just know other people that do. That's why I'm able to describe it so well today. So that's number one, our agenda. Number second internal hearing problem is negative self-talk. Where rather than hearing God's still small voice, that you just have this internal monologue a voice that is constantly tearing you down. Uh, like you might think, man, God would never want to be around me or speak to me with my past, the things that I've done. I'm not good enough to know God. Or maybe you're parroting these words that someone else has spoken over you. And so you need the mind of Christ. You need, you need the, the power of God to break the lies of the enemy in your life. So even if that's you, I want to encourage you to receive prayer for that after uh, the service is done. Uh, number three is selective hearing. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. Like, for some reason, when, you, when it's time to brush your teeth, your child needs to be told multiple times until they do it. But whenever there's cake, you only need to tell them once, and then they're on it, right? Uh, and here's the thing. As we talked about, Jesus' inclusion of Mary is disruptive for the accepted way of things. You know, and this is true when Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees. Like, they have something to lose when Jesus is challenging them because they're the ones that control this whole religious system. And so I think we need to face this uneasy truth today, which is that sometimes we have selective hearing whenever it comes from hearing God. Like, we are not exactly sure if we want to hear God's voice. Because if we do, then it's going to mean that He's going to challenge us, uh, challenge a way that we live, an area of comfort in our life, or an, like an idol. And so what it means is if we're going to hear from God, it means the end of our own control. But whenever we relinquish control, that's whenever we can start to receive God's best for us. So those are some internal hearing problems. External hearing problems, one I would to say is like the expectations of others. You know, Mary and Martha, they are subject to the expectations of their broader culture. And so in Roman culture, women just learn, hey, I am not valued here. And so we all have our own cultural expectations that we live with every day. So maybe you are a parent and you feel like you've just got to do everything to set up your child for success. You've got to really help them out in life. And so with all that you do, you just feel like this is never going to be enough. Or maybe you've j you're a student at school and you just always feel like under this crushing weight of outcompeting others that you have to achieve so much in order to get ahead. And so that it just feels like hard to wake up every day with all this burden of expectations that you have. And I think it's easier than ever now in this day and age to compare ourselves to others because of social media. We're all, always seeing these idealized versions of life and we just somehow don't match up to that. But this is what I think is really beautiful about Jesus' embrace of Mary and Martha, is that in a world where they are expendable, Jesus shows them how they are valuable. And so many of us may just feel like a cog in the wheel uh, that we just need to get on board unless we, uh, or else we're going to get run over. But Jesus wants us to know you are not expendable. You are valuable. He wants to be with you. He wants to partner with you in life. Uh, the other external hearing problem I'll just call noise pollution. <laughs> uh, you know, Mary 
She has Martha on her case. Jesus is always dealing with the accusations of the Pharisees. Uh, right now, there's an organization that I found really interesting. It's called Quiet Parks International. And so their, one of their goals is to help solve the problem of noise pollution. And they said that, uh, no, uh, that quiet spaces are on the verge of extinction in the United States. That in fact, 97% of the US population has chronic exposure to noise noise pollution. And the problem with this is when we're exposed to a lot of noise, it depletes our energy. It takes a lot of our focus and attention. That means that it's bad for your stress levels, which means that noise is bad for your sleeping, and which means that you're going to have chronic fatigue because of noise pollution. And then it's no surprise that research shows that constant exposure to noise actually increases cardiovascular disease. Now, we live in a noise-polluted world. Like, I don't, I don't think I have to convince anyone of that. And especially, we're in an election season, so we're going to have all these voices that are shouting at us, trying to get our attention. And even, uh, like, with any moment that we could have to ourselves, we've got these screens that follow us around everywhere. And here's the thing. Noise isn't always bad, right? Like, coworkers, family, friends, like, these are good blessings that God has given us. The problem comes whenever it all drowns out the frequency of God's voice. So as we just went through that list, I want to ask you, which of the, what, what barrier are you facing right now in hearing from God? This is what we're going to talk about in our life groups this week. We're going to name those things that are preventing us from hearing from God so we can do some spiritual ear training and learn to listen to God's voice. So as I said, Pastor Christy will help us with that next week. But today, I just want to give us a bit of a starting point for hearing from God. Uh, and this, this is the words of uh, Pastor Rich Villadas, and it's this, befriend silence. Befriend silence. If you re rearrange the word listen, it spells silent. And so this, in my own life, when I meet with God, I found it's really helpful to begin with just silence, resting in God's presence where I don't have to do anything, I don't have to say anything. I simply am placing myself in a place where I'm becoming aware of God's presence. And so I know we've got busy lives, and so I'm not saying we have to become like monks all the time, but just like, when's some space that you would normally be bored, but you're using a screen to kind of stave that off? Like, why don't we just learn to spend some time in silence, or even in our time, if we start our day reading scripture and, and some time in prayer with God, just spend that time uh, li having little pockets throughout the day where we recognize God's presence. Uh, Pastor Rich says this, the more familiar you are with someone, the easier it is to be silent in their presence. Which makes me think, our inability to be silent with God just might reveal how unfamiliar we are with him. So this is why in our services, too, we want to we wanna make space to hear God's still, small voice speaking to us, where we want to rest in God's presence. And so if that's something that you've never done before, it tends to feel like an eternity. <laughs> Anytime that there's like space, you're just waiting for the talking to start again, like you're waiting for the silence to be over. Uh, and here's the other thing is I think for most of us, when we start just resting in God's presence in this way, you feel bad at it because you start to realize just like how much internal noise there is having it. But, but there's no way to achieve anything with this. It's like we want to pay attention to whatever God is bringing up, and God is going to, we can trust that God's going to meet us where we are. Uh, and so maybe there's an area of your life that you're worried about, and you just use this space to give that over to God. Maybe there's like a to-do list starting to be written in your mind, so you start to write it out externally so you can pay attention to God. Uh, and in silence, what we're starting to do is we're recentering the eyes of our heart on Jesus. And so being trained in these couple of minutes every day helps this to happen in the rest of our day where we're able to refocus our attentiveness on God so we're doing things with him instead of just for him. And so, uh, so today we're going to conclude by 
coming to Jesus at the communion table. This is a place where we can experience his presence. But before we do that, uh, I'm going to have us just spend one minute of time resting in God's presence. We're going to practice this right now. So I'm going to set my handy-dandy timer on my phone. And so I want to encourage you, close your eyes. And, and maybe even you want to put your hands in a receiving posture, whatever you need to do to just kind of be attentive during this time. And so, Jesus, we thank you that right now we're in your loving presence. And so we just spend one minute resting with you. There it is. That was one minute. Resting with Jesus. I don't know how that went for you. Some of you are like, probably like, I wanted to leave. This, <laughs> it was terrible. Uh, others of us, it felt like, wow, this, I could use a lot more of this. Uh, wherever you are, like, that's where you are today. Like, God will meet you where you are. Jesus today is making this invitation for us to be near him in his presence, where we don't have to do anything, we don't have to be good at anything, we're just with him, wherever we are, like in our state today. Uh, so as we draw near to Jesus today at communion, uh, excuse me, uh, I want to encourage you that there, there is, you don't have to be a member of Crossroads to participate in communion. Uh, this is a way that we draw near to Jesus. And so uh, if you simply have that desire, Jesus wants to draw near to you. And so as we come near to Jesus, one of the things we want to do is uh, confess things to him. Before I get there, uh, how communion will work today is there, there will be an usher uh, by your aisle who will dismiss you. And so as you come forward, have your hands in a receiving pocket posture to receive the elements up front. Uh, don't take them right there. Ret we'll uh, take them all together at the end, so return to your seat through this center aisle, and uh, we'll receive them all together at the end. But as we come into Jesus' presence, uh, let's just come to him. Jesus, we thank you that you draw near to us. And as we draw near to you, God, uh, there are things that are on our hearts that we know are separating us from you. So right now, just in this silence, we confess to you those ways that we've fallen short. That scripture says that you are, when we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just and forgive us from all unrighteousness. And so God, as we come to you, we pray as Jesus taught his disciples, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he shared a meal with his disciples, and he took the bread, giving thanks to God for it, and then he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. After they had eaten, he took the cup, and once again he gave thanks to God, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of your sins and for the sins of many. As often as you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. 
The gifts of God are here for God's children. Come and eat and be satisfied. Please stand together. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. I'm laying down. All my religion, I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. I'm laying down. All my religion, I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord. That I could box you in But I'm laying down I want to know you, Lord I used to think That I could box you in But I'm laying down I want to know you, Lord I'm laying down All my religion I'm laying down, I want to know you, Lord. I'm laying down, all my religion. I'm laying down, I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord. In 
the simple gospel, I will rejoice in you, Lord. I will rejoice. Find me in the dust. You say no amount of truth can separate. Amen. We receive the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus, we thank you that with simple truth of the gospel, that we don't do anything to receive your love, but God, that your love is pursuing us, that you are coming towards us. So Jesus, today we choose to be present with you. May the eyes of our heart be attentive to you. As we've received these elements today, uh, may we become the body and blood of Christ for the world. May we be the body of Christ together as the church so that others might know your love uh, because of us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So that concludes our service. I want to invite you, if you want to receive prayer, come to the foot of the cross for that. Uh, Ryan is out in the lobby with some donuts if you want to go there for next step. Uh, there's a blood truck outside that uh, you can donate some blood today. They're taking some walk-ins. But as we go, we're done being the church in here. We're going to be the church out there. Go in God's peace and serve the Lord. Amen.